Good afternoon and thank you for joining our briefing on the City of Philadelphia's response to COVID-19. Today, all of our speakers are joining the briefing virtually to adhere to social distancing guidelines. We will begin our briefing today with opening remarks from Mayor Jim Kenney. Mayor, you now have the floor. Thanks, Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone. As the city continues to slowly reopen, I know that many families are looking for child care and quality learning opportunities for their children. All children deserve to have great early educational education experiences, regardless of their family's income or zip code, which is why I'm really glad to announce that PHL Pre-K is enrolling for the fall. PHL Pre-K is the city's free quality pre-K program, which is funded by the beverage tax. The program has served over 6,000 children since 2017. This year, we are funding free pre-K at over 130 locations throughout the city. Families can find a participating location and sign up by calling 844-PHL-PRE-K or by visiting phlprek.org. That's phlprek.org. All PHL Pre-K providers will follow the child care guidance that's been developed by the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. This includes mask requirements, social distancing and containment strategies, and new cleaning protocols. In addition, all providers must go through PHL Pre-K's COVID-19 preparedness screening process with PHL Pre-K in order to participate in the program this year. We just can't allow the pandemic to take safe quality learning experiences away from our children, especially at the most critical stage in their development. And I'm proud that we are continuing to offer this opportunity for Philadelphia's youngest learners and for their families. We cannot let this pandemic stop our children from getting a jump start on their education and their futures. Again, more information is available on the PHL Pre-K website. And now to Dr. Farley for his daily update. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, the situation with the coronavirus epidemic in Philadelphia is similar to where we were two days ago. Uh, here are the numbers. Uh, since this time yesterday, we've identified 136 new cases of the coronavirus infection in Philadelphia residents, bringing us to a total of 30,213 since the beginning of the epidemic. Now, in the past week that ended last Saturday, uh, July 29th, we were averaging about 165 cases per day. Uh, it fluctuates a lot day to day, so averages are worth looking at. That's up from 141 cases per day the week before and 111 cases per day the week before that. Now, the new cases that we're reporting today are still predominantly younger people. 33% were under the age of 30 and 57% were under the age of 40. Uh, still, that does mean that there are people above the age 60 uh, that are in the vulnerable group. Uh, in our hospitals, uh, just an update here, uh, as of yesterday afternoon, we had 158 patients with COVID infection in hospitals in the city of Philadelphia and 290 in the region. That's a slight increase from the numbers that we had one week ago. Uh, still, that was very low compared to the number of patients we had in the hospitals during the peak of the first uh, epidemic wave back in April. Since this time yesterday, we've identified 11 new deaths from the coronavirus infection uh, bringing in Philadelphia residents, bringing us to a total of 1,691 since the beginning of the epidemic. Uh, of those 859 or 51% were in nursing homes. Now that uh, 11 deaths that we identified in one day was a result of our matching against death certificates and those are deaths that have occurred sometime in the past. Uh, the, uh, let me just give you an update on where we are with nursing homes. Uh, in recent weeks, we've had very few cases in nursing homes uh, in residents or staff citywide. Uh, nonetheless, with the increasing cases in the community as a whole, we're very concerned about this epidemic wave getting into facilities. This is clearly the highest risk situation of any of the situations across the entire city. And so we are now working uh, collaboratively with uh, Penn Medicine, uh, with Jefferson Hospital System, with Temple's Hospital System to, report, to support uh, the nursing homes citywide. Uh, that support will include uh, testing for residents as needed uh, and advice on infection control and procedures uh, and any other uh, education, whatever support nursing homes need. Our goal is to have so that the virus doesn't get into nursing homes at all, uh, but if it does get into nursing homes, we absolutely limit it so that it's not gonna affect uh, residents in that nursing home. Just an update on where we are with testing. We are gradually expanding uh, the number of sites where testing is available across the city uh, and having sites expand their hours, increase accessibility. Uh, go to our website, www.phila.gov testing for more information on all the sites that are available across the city. Um, the, uh, we have had problems with laboratories uh, with a very long turnaround time for, uh, reporting results, uh, unacceptably long. 
Uh, we are seeing a small improvement uh, in that turnaround time with one of the two big national laboratories. Uh, and at the same time, we're still working on trying to redirect testing to local laboratories where we hope to get faster turnaround times. Still though, it is far too long um, at a number of sites. Um, that's where we are with Philadelphia. In the region as a whole, we are seeing increasing case counts in the collar counties around Philadelphia, um, and as well as Camden, New Jersey across the river. Uh, and we're seeing increasing uh, coronavirus case counts in the state of Pennsylvania as a whole. Uh, interestingly, in the nation as a whole, in the US, the epidemic looks like it might be just starting to decline. Uh, daily case counts in particular are now clearly falling in the states that were the earliest states in the second, second epidemic wave, specifically Arizona and Texas and Florida. Those are still very heavily affected. They're seeing many cases per day, but the, the downward trend is a good thing. Um, I'm hopeful that that downward trend will go, go north in the same way the increasing trend in the past uh, came north and have affected us. And just an update on um, uh, dining and restaurants. Uh, two days ago, I announced that we were going to extend the prohibition on indoor dining at restaurants until September 1st. Just want to clarify that. Um, first of all, uh, the restaurant managers were given a pretty short notice for that extension, just a few days, uh, and that was probably not enough time. And so we apologize that we didn't give restaurant managers enough time for that. Um, I want to clarify though, for the next deadline, uh, that what we're saying now is we're extending this prohibition until at least September 1st. We don't guarantee that restaurants will be allowed uh, to have indoor dining as of September 1st, uh, but we want to give people a better sense of the timeline this time around. So we will make a decision about whether restaurants can start indoor dining on September 1st uh, by August 21st. So the restaurants will have at least 10 days to plan whether they will be opening or not opening on September 1st. Um, also, the, uh, that uh, restriction on indoor dining is one of uh, the restrictions that are part of our modified restricted green phase. Those other restrictions likewise are going to be remain in effect on the same schedule uh, at least until September 1st. That includes our senior daycare centers. Uh, those are centers where I know many seniors wanna go there and the centers wanna open up and provide those services. But we're very worried about seniors who are vulnerable to this infection getting together in a, in a location where the virus could easily spread. Um, back in the community as a whole, we are uh, working with businesses to have them continue to uh, encourage and at times enforce uh, our safety standards. Um, citywide, we have uh, it was set up a number of weeks ago a process where the Medical Reserve Corps volunteers were going to businesses door to door to pass out flyers with our safety standards, our, our safety checklist, uh, and also posters that stores could put up to remind people, and particularly about the requirement for wearing masks. Uh, they're continuing to do that. Uh, they are in Germantown this week. They're going to be West Philadelphia next week, and they're going to continue to hit commercial corridors across the city. Uh, let's talk about where we are with mask use uh, first. Just a reminder, I keep coming back to masks. Uh, you see that ad over my shoulder because it's so important. Uh, everyone just remember, wear one when you're outside of the house. This is something really should be standard equipment when you get out of the house. Uh, we have a media campaign uh, like that picture uh, across my, uh, my shoulder here that's up across the city. Um, and we want to increase mask use with that. Uh, there's now, as of today, a graph on our website that shows what our trends are in mask use in Philadelphia. This comes from our observations of people uh, as they exit retail stores or as they pass through interior SEPTA stations. Uh, it, it's a new data system, so we're learning exactly how to interpret the results. Uh, so interpret them with some caution, but it does appear to be that there's an increasing trend. You see that the first data point there in June is somewhere around 60%. Uh, the most recent data point is at 76%. So the two lessons for this is, first of all, most residents are doing the right thing. Uh, but not quite enough. Uh, we'd love to have that at least 80%. I would love to have it be at 90%. So we just need to get the people who are not quite doing this yet to be using masks. Um, and we're gonna continue to track that weekly, uh, but it does appear to be that it's moving in the right direction. Finally, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, people who are unusually vulnerable to this infection in the city right now. You know, there is clearly more virus circulating in Philadelphia right now than is safe. Uh, so I wanna remind people over the age of 65, or people with chronic medical conditions that you are at greater risk for a serious infection. Uh, the way to uh, avoid getting infected is to stay home and then have other members of your household who are out and about and might be exposed to the virus. Uh, they should wear a mask when they're out and about. And when they come back in, you do not wanna be exposed to them. So have them wear a mask when they're around you, even inside the house, if they've been out and about and you should wear a mask when you're around them. It may feel awkward to be wearing masks when you're around your household members uh, and your relatives 
Uh, but if you stay home, that's your only risk. If you can prevent that risk, you can avoid getting this, what potentially be a very serious infection. So that's the update for today. More information is on everything is on our website, www.phila.gov slash COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farley. We are now gonna to move to Armando who will deliver the Spanish language translation of both the mayor and Dr. Farley's remarks. Palabra principal de Jim Kenny para el jueves 30 de julio del 2020. Buenas tardes a todos. A medida que las actividades en la ciudad continúan reanudándose lentamente, sé que muchas familias buscan cuidado para sus hijos y oportunidades de aprendizaje de calidad para sus niños. Todos ellos merecen una excelente educación temprana, independientemente de los ingresos o del código postal de su familia. Por eso, me complace anunciar que las matrículas para el PHL Pre-K han iniciado para el otoño. PHL Pre-K es un programa de pre-kinder gratuito y de calidad de la ciudad financiado por el impuesto a las bebidas azucaradas. Este programa ha educado ya a más de 6,000 niños desde el año 2017. Este año estamos financiando Pre-K gratuitamente en más de 130 centros de aprendizaje temprano en toda la ciudad. Las familias pueden encontrar un centro para inscribir a sus niños llamando al 844-PHL-PREK o visitando phlprek.org. Todos los proveedores de PHL Pre-K cumplirán las pautas de cuidado infantil que ha preparado el Departamento de Salud Pública de Filadelfia. Esto incluye el uso obligatorio de mascarillas o tapabocas, el distanciamiento social, las estrategias de contención y los nuevos protocolos de limpieza. Además, todos los proveedores deben pasar por el proceso de evaluación para poder participar en el programa este año. Nosotros no podemos permitir que la pandemia les quite a nuestros niños experiencias de aprendizaje seguras y de calidad, especialmente en la etapa más crítica en su desarrollo. Estoy orgulloso de seguir ofreciendo esta oportunidad para los estudiantes más jóvenes de Filadelfia y para sus familias. Nosotros no podemos permitir que esta pandemia impida que nuestros hijos comiencen su educación adecuadamente. Nuevamente, les recuerdo que hay más información disponible en el sitio web de PHL Pre-K. Y esta es la actualización en materia de salud para el jueves 30 de julio del año 2020. La situación que tenemos ahora es similar a la de hace dos días. Hemos visto un aumento en los casos en Filadelfia y en nuestra región. El día de hoy reportamos 136 nuevos casos con un total de 30,213 casos acumulados. En promedio, hemos tenido 165 casos diarios durante la última semana que terminó el 25 de julio. Ha habido un aumento de los casos porque hace dos semanas estábamos reportando 141 casos diarios en promedio y hace tres semanas 111 casos. Los nuevos casos reportados se están presentando predominantemente entre los más jóvenes. El 33% de los casos se han reportado en los menores de 30 años y el 57% de los casos en menores de 40 años de edad. Respecto a los casos en los hogares de ancianos, estamos preocupados que esta ola pueda golpear fuertemente estos centros. Estamos trabajando conjuntamente con Penn, Jefferson y Temple para obtener el apoyo necesario. En cuanto a los pacientes hospitalizados, hay 158 pacientes hospitalizados por la COVID-19 en hospitales de Filadelfia y 290 en la región. El aumento continúa si lo comparamos con las cifras que teníamos hace una semana. Sin embargo, este es un número bajo al compararlo con el repunte de hospitalizaciones que tuvimos a fines de abril. Hoy, lamentablemente, reportamos 11 fallecimientos por la COVID-19 en la ciudad. El total acumulado de muertes por la COVID-19 es de 1,691 muertes. 859 de estas se registraron en hogares de ancianos y representan un 51% del total de muertes. Queremos recordarles a todos que las pruebas siguen disponibles. Hay muchos centros de pruebas y estos pueden ubicarse visitando fila.gov barra diagonal COVID guión testing guión sites. Desafortunadamente, continúan los retrasos en el envío de los resultados desde los dos laboratorios más grandes de la región. Seguimos trabajando para buscar la forma de redireccionar estas pruebas a otros laboratorios. En la región, los casos continúan aumentando en los condados que se encuentran alrededor de Filadelfia, incluyendo al condado de Camden en New Jersey. Los casos van aumentando en Pensilvania, sin duda alguna. Pero en cuanto a la evolución de la pandemia en los Estados Unidos, vemos que ha llegado a un punto de estabilización e incluso pudiera estar en declive ya. 
Los casos diarios están disminuyendo en los estados que lideraron esta segunda ola, es decir, Arizona, Texas y la Florida. Otro tema de interés es el reinicio del servicio en el interior de los restaurantes. El servicio en el interior de los restaurantes ha sido pospuesto hasta por lo menos el primero de septiembre. Nosotros anunciaremos una decisión sobre si abrimos o no el primero de septiembre, el día 21 de agosto, para que así los restaurantes tengan 10 días para prepararse. Las otras restricciones de la fase verde modificada permanecerán en efecto. Esto incluye a los centros de cuidado de adultos mayores. Recordamos que el uso de las mascarillas o tapabocas es obligatorio. Uno debe usarla al salir de casa. Continuamos difundiendo nuestras directrices de seguridad entre los negocios de Filadelfia. Los voluntarios siguen visitando los negocios con volantes y afiches. Esta semana estaremos cubriendo el área de Germantown y la semana que viene estaremos en el oeste de Filadelfia. Un recordatorio para las poblaciones vulnerables. Las personas mayores de 65 años o con condiciones crónicas deben permanecer en casa. Usa tu mascarilla y mantén la distancia social. Solo tú puedes frenar la entrada del COVID-19 en tu casa. Gracias. Thank you, Armando. We will now move to the Q&A portion for members of the media. Today, we do have Shante Brown, our director of PHL Pre-K Operations with us to answer any questions you might have on that program. I also want to note that the mayor does have to leave the briefing a bit early today, but we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. As usual, we do have limited time, so please only um, ask up to three questions or fewer. We will do a second round of questions if time permits. And for those logged in today, you can use the raise your hand feature, which is under the participants list. And we ask that you turn on your video to ask your question if you are able to. We will now unmute reporters one by one to ask their questions, starting with Marcus Espinoza of Fox 29. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, folks. So I wanted to ask about um, the 150 sanitation workers that are uh, being hired and um, how that process worked and if you've already hired them and uh, how people can apply if they want to be a part of that for the mayor. Kelly, we doing we doing COVID first or, or should I wait to come around? For I, that? I mean, I might, I might as well take it because I probably won't be here by the time we get around to the second round. I mean, obviously we've had some challenges with the sanitation department and uh, we've had a high number of um, uh, employees that have come down with the, with the, with the virus. We've had extremely hot weather. We haven't had a day under 70 since July 7th, uh, mostly in the nineties and eighties and nineties. We had two major storms um, that, um, uh, that slowed up our pro progress and people have been home and they've been doing home improvement work and all kinds of other stuff and generating a lot more trash than they normally would if they were going to work every day. Uh, so our guys got you know, bogged down both with the, the lack of people out there being able to do the work and with all the volume of work. Uh, these are, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong from either Brian or Tumar if they're on. These are people that I think were on the list, uh, laborers list to begin with, I think there's 125. Uh, and those have been uh, processed or being processed so that they can uh, add to the, uh, add to the uh, complement of people doing sanitation work. Uh, and just a mayor's correct. These are 120 laborers that were already on the list uh, that will be brought on for a temporary basis on uh, that process is moving forward now. And then just real quick, when do you guys expect to be caught up? We, we have a cumbersome um, HR process. We're trying to get through. Uh, I, the last thing I had heard was three weeks, two or three weeks. I think we're a week into that process already. Uh, so soon, soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go now to Laura McChrystal of the Inquirer. Good afternoon. Um, I'm wondering, first of all, um, Dr. Farley or the mayor, um, anything you can tell us, um, given the Phillies announcement of COVID cases, um, how the city is working with them, any updates there? Simply to say that we, we uh, have been consulting with uh, both teams uh, about this and uh, that we feel like the, uh, the cluster is contained uh, and that the people at Philadelphia are not at risk um, and they're going to handle it from here. Okay. 
Um, and Dr. Farley, a question on the, you mentioned delayed turnaround time for test results. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how does that have an impact on like the number of cases you're reporting per day? So when you say 136 cases Per day, that seems lower than like the average for the last week. Do you expect that to increase in the coming days kind of retroactively as those tests come in? Yeah, so that if you look at the graph on our website, that's the date in which the test was run in the laboratory. Um, and that's later than when the test sample was collected. And so um, the, that's not the numbers I'm going to give you are not that much different from what's on the website. But what's on the website is a little bit of a delay from what's actually happening in the community. Uh, so uh, it's not going to change the numbers I'm reporting very much, but it does mean that we do not have as up-to-date a picture of that of spread in the community as we'd like to. Okay. Um, and lastly, you mentioned um, the date by which you'll make a decision on indoor dining. Right. Um, can you comment on what, you know, what would the situation kind of have to look like with the virus in order to allow that by September 1st? Uh, I would certainly want to see our case rates falling, uh, and I would say falling substantially to where we, we feel comfortable that this is, uh, we have less viral activity in the city. Um, and I think evidence from elsewhere where there is indoor dining that, that they're not seeing uh, the sort of outbreaks that we're seeing right now. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Laura. We're gonna to go to Jacqueline Lee of 6ABC now. So as it relates to indoor dining, Dr. Farley, you said that the collar counties had um, a much higher rate of positivity, uh, but Philadelphia has not had indoor dining yet. Do you think indoor dining could be a reason why there might be a huge spike in COVID cases in places like Delaware County? Um, I'm certainly concerned where there is indoor dining that that's a risk, and I can't say whether it might be you know, feeding the increases we're seeing around the county. Uh, I do think it was the right decision for us not to allow it here. Um, and I do th think if we had done that, I would suspect that our case rates would be higher than they are now. Do you think that the state needs to shut down again now that the color counties are seeing a huge increase? In uh, you know, that's something that um, I, you know, it's a lot of different factors. I, I'm not going to recommend that now. Uh, we're in constant contact with the state. If things get much worse, that may be something that, uh, that they should do. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jacqueline. We're going to go to Natasha Brown of CBS3 now. Hi, Esther. How are you? Um, I just wanted to have a couple questions. Uh, one for the mayor, if he's still around. I'm here. Uh, yeah, hi, Mayor. Uh, just to, uh, you're very passionate about starting the pre-K enrollment, and you're not, you don't want to let this pandemic affect that. So tell me how comfortable you are with that at this point and with parents who may be a little skeptical still about, well, should I send my kids somewhere? You know, how am I going to know they're going to be safe? My, my level of comfort is based on the information given to me by Dr. Farley and the Department of Health. Um, we've followed that uh, process from the very, very beginning, and we've had success in, in driving down the numbers and, and even when there's spikes are keeping them stable. Um, and he believes and the department believes that the protocols set up for PHL pre-K are sufficient to keep our children and the staff safe. Uh, if something turns out to be different than that, uh, we, will we will adjust accordingly. But, the, the, you know, this is, this is not an easy process that we're doing, but it's made, it, it makes it easier for me if we follow the medicine and the science and don't get caught up in the politics and the economics. Yeah, and if I could get Dr. Farley to comment as well, just since that's where you're getting your guidance as well, Dr. Farley, just about pre-K. In the fall? Yeah, so I mean, our, our view about daycare centers in general or, you know, pre K age group is that in general, the younger the child, the less risk they are for getting a serious infection and maybe less risk they are for getting any infection, um, and probably the less likely they are to spread the infection. Uh, so that that's, that younger group is going to be safer than an older group. And also, um, PHL pre K as well as child care centers have a relatively small number of children um, in one place. They're not a, like a school that has 500. You know, you can have small classes of children. So that also lowers the risk. Um, and then we have a number of safety procedures for people to follow that we should, would limit the risk. I don't think in any setting, though, to be honest, the risk is going to be zero. Uh, I do think that the risk is low enough that it makes sense when we're also reviewing the long-term, lifelong impacts of, of the education if they get there. Yeah, and Dr. Foley, um, just in reference to the recent announcement by the, the school district of Philadelphia and what they're having to do in terms of 
reverting back to now just all online classes. Um, how much of a factor did your, your research play into that happening as well and then changing course on that? Um, we, as you might have seen at the school board meeting, we said that they could open if they followed our guidance. This was a decision made by the school district uh, based on the, the uh, concerns about teachers. It, it wasn't us that said that they uh, could not provide in school uh, education. Okay, thank you very much. Dante, did you want to provide any additional um, comment on the procedures? Sure. So this year, um, hello everyone. I'm Shante Brown, Director of Operations for PHL Pre-K. Um, this year, we um, particularly because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we put in some specific safety protocols to ensure that our agencies are um, safe and, and ready um, and available for children. So prior to reopening, all of our agencies are required to submit a health and safety plan. It's a five-part screener um, and health and safety is a part of the screener. In addition, they must also have a plan in the event that um, anyone at the agency, be it staff and or children, um, um, uh, are diagnosed with any COVID-19 um, symptoms, what will happen to the agency, the actual um, reopening plan, the cleaning plan, all of that must be submitted and is vetted by our entire team, including our child care health consultant prior to being able to um, open or enroll any children. So that's new, um, that's new protocols um, because of the pandemic. Okay, so that's all new, all right. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Natasha. We're gonna go to Shaira Arias now of Telemundo. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hola, Armando. Eh, okay. So the la primera pregunta va a ser, ¿cuál es la tendencia que ustedes tendrán que ver en cuanto al aumento de casos del COVID-19 para que la ciudad tenga que retroceder y regresar a estar, básicamente vamos a decir que en la fase amarilla, roja, o incluso tener que volver a estar? Eso sería una pregunta para el doctor Farley. The first question is for Dr. Farley. What is the trend that you would have to see in terms of an increase of cases of COVID-19 for the city to return to the yellow or the red phase or even to a new lockdown? Yeah, I, I can't give you any specific number criteria. I can simply say that uh, the faster cases are rising and, and the, uh, the higher the numbers are, uh, the more likely we are to have more restrictions. We're trying to have those restrictions be more targeted than simply uh, across the board um, shutdown. Uh, so we're also paying attention to where spread might be occurring. So if it's occurring in a specific type of activity or type of sector, we might be more likely to shut that down than the entire uh, city. So because we're trying to keep uh, the, our city going uh, through this epidemic, we have to last uh, several more months. We want to be as targeted as possible. No puedo decirte eh, específicamente cuál sería el criterio en cuanto a las cifras que tendríamos que observar, pero obviamente sabemos que los números van a seguir subiendo. Estas restricciones no serían alrededor de toda la ciudad, sino serían diseñadas en relación a dónde se ocurre estos incrementos o qué actividades o qué entornos se asocian con estos aumentos. Obviamente esas actividades serían restringidas, pero no vemos por este momento de que en una segunda ola tendríamos que ejercer una restricción total en la ciudad. Mi segunda pregunta es, eh, tenemos entendido que en Filadelfia, según expertos médicos, hay graves eh, racial disparities, desigualdad racial, ¿verdad? Donde no tienen acceso a recursos como para hacerse la prueba, ya si sea porque no tienen transporte, internet para tener una cita virtual, eh, la falta de información también en español, mientras que la situación económica se va agravando por la pandemia, las personas están perdiendo su trabajo, cada vez está un poco más difícil para algunas eh, familias eh, minorías con menos recursos. ¿De qué manera la segunda ola sería aún más severa para esas comunidades. ¿Y esa pregunta es para el alcalde o para el...? Para, eh, yo creo que para ambos. The second question may be both for the mayor and for Dr. Farley. In Philadelphia, according to medical experts, there are serious racial disparities where minorities don't have access to internet to make virtual medical appointments or lack of access to transportation to get tested. There's also a lack of information in Spanish and because the economic situation is getting worse due to the pandemic, there are now more minority families with less resources. How would a second wave be even, wouldn't it be more severe for these communities? Well, I gotta let Dr. Farley talk about the second wave, but there are, there are inequities uh, that have existed for generations in this country when it comes 
to healthcare education, uh, racism, and, and, and everything else. Uh, we're working, our, we're doing our best, as a matter of fact, with our, our virtual schooling uh, to get as many families as possible uh, plugged into the internet and get the right equipment to them so that they can be online, both for school, uh, for, for job searches, for other information, medical, medical um, appointments and the like. Uh, yeah, we have a long way to go and we're working hard to, to fix those inequities. One of the things we could have uh, is, a, is a more robust national health care system uh, like other civilized countries around the world uh, that, we, that we see uh, them controlling these kind, this kind of pandemic much faster than we have. Uh, and um, that's why I'll, I'll, I'm not going to get into politics, but that's why I will make the choice that I will make in November uh, to change these things uh, for the better. And just let me just add that there definitely are uh, disparities um, in infection and serious infection rates by race and also by ethnicity. Uh, and uh, and, so, and that, that uh, is a deeper problem than you might think. Um, it definitely uh, uh, is reflective of our history of racism in this country and, and a lot of structural factors behind that. Uh, however, we do have a concrete plan to try to mitigate that as much as possible. Our racial equity plan is something we released earlier this week. And it talks about the steps we're taking to increase access to testing, uh, to increase access to information, including information in uh, community newspapers and information in Spanish. All of our materials are always translated in Spanish. You know, our contact tracing, we have one entire team that's uh, Spanish speaking. So we're doing what we can. Um, I, I do worry that if the second epidemic wave occurs, uh, that it's going to likewise have a disproportionate impact on the people who are uh, uh, you know, less enfranchised. Uh, uh, but we're doing everything we can to try to minimize that. La primera parte de la respuesta la da el alcalde y obviamente el alcalde nos dice de que esto es algo que se remonta a otras generaciones donde ha habido problemas inherentes a la estructura de esta sociedad, donde ha habido problemas de racismo también. Y nosotros estamos tratando de resolver lo mejor que podemos estos problemas. Estamos ofreciendo escuelas virtuales de acceso cibernético, estamos proporcionando equipos para que la gente pueda continuar con su educación, para que pueda hacer búsquedas de empleo para que obtengan información, para que puedan hacer citas médicas. Estamos trabajando bastante arduamente para tratar de resolver estas inequidades. Tenemos el ejemplo de los otros países que han enfrentado mejor esta pandemia, probablemente porque tienen un servicio de acceso nacional a los sistemas de salud. Y esperamos que las cosas cambien para el día 13 de noviembre en esta dirección. Agrega el comisionado Farley de que obviamente existen disparidades en nuestro sistema, que tiene en su origen en inequidades en raza y en etnicidad, es un problema más profundo que se remonta a la historia de racismo que existe en nuestro entorno. Sin embargo, tenemos planes concretos de poder tratar de resolver estas disparidades o inequidades y este plan incluye, en cuanto a la pandemia, el proporcionar acceso a pruebas, el proporcionar información. Nosotros estamos apoyándonos en los periódicos comunitarios, también estamos teniendo traducción de la información al español, estamos haciendo el programa de eh, búsqueda de contactos en cuanto a esta pandemia y una segunda ola obviamente replicaría estas estructuras existentes y tendría un impacto elevadamente desproporcionado para las minorías. Fernando, si me podrías eh, repetir un poco de lo que ya mencionó Mayor Jim Kenney al principio de, de su anuncio de, de pre-K y de la apertura porque nosotros se nos desconectó eh, un poco, entonces no se te escuchaba, tú no te escuchabas muy bien cuando estabas hablando lo que fue el principio del anuncio cuando él mencionó de que ya iban a abrirlo el eh, pre-K. Perdón, Shaira, ¿puedes repetir esta última pregunta? Porque obviamente hay dificultades para entender, para escuchar. ¿Tú me puedes repetir lo que tú dijiste en español de lo que fue eh, Mayor Jim Kenney, del anuncio de él? Porque no te escuchabas muy bien cuando estabas traduciendo en español lo que él dijo, Mayor Jim Kenney. La, la, el discurso el, inicial el, del alcalde. Sí, sí. Sí. En estos momentos no, no lo puedo hacer porque es algo relativamente largo, pero lo podemos dejar para el final. Shara would be interested in having a repeat of what the mayor's uh, message was today, and I'm suggesting that we leave it till the end because it's a lengthy presentation. I do have the capacity of doing it, but I don't know if this is a good time to do it in the press oh, conference. Okay. Well, the, okay. the initial presentation? Yes. Um, um, I don't know from a timing perspective. Well, that's what I'm suggesting, that we leave it for the very end if we have the time to do it. We have the means to do it. Maybe but I, I, I won't be here at the very, very end because I have to go to the building to another meeting. No, I do have the words. Meaning oh, fine. Finish, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. will hold that. Thank you, Armando. Sure. We will hold that till the end. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
We're going to move to Arjenis Figueroa of Univision now. Sí, buenas tardes, Armando. Buenas tardes, Arjenis. Armando, mi pregunta es para el alcalde Kenny. Eh, tomando en cuenta que usted dijo que lidiaría con la situación de las personas sin hogar en los campamentos y que actualmente 40.000 personas están en la lista de espera para una vivienda en Filadelfia. ¿Cómo pueden eh, satisfacer esas necesidades en medio de una segunda ola de la pandemia y en un déficit presupuestario histórico? Bien, Argenis. La pregunta es para Mayor Kenny. You have talked about dealing with the issue of the homeless and the camps in the city. And you've told us that there's about 40,000 people that are now on a wait list for a home. How would you be able to meet these needs if there's a second wave hitting the city for the pandemic, given the historic financial deficit that the city is facing? Um, how would we provide housing for folks? ¿Cómo les diéramos alojamiento y casas a esta gente? Argeni. Uh, sí, ¿cómo, ¿cómo enfrentarían esa situación? ¿Cómo los ayudarían a salir de la situación de estar sin hogar? Yes, how would you deal with the situation? How would you provide them help in order to get out of this well, situation? Hopefully what we're doing now will keep that from happening. Uh, secondly, uh, we'll deal with it as we, we didn't expect this pandemic to happen either. Didn't expect the uh, civil unrest and didn't expect uh, the financial implications of all of this. Uh, we will do our best to adjust. Uh, I can't, it's hard for me to speculate on something that hasn't happened and we don't know how, how deep or wide any increase would be. Uh, and I could answer that question better Uh, if and when it comes, and hopefully, uh, knock wood, it won't come, uh, and um, and we can continue to try to push these numbers down and uh, get out of this whole mess we're in. Bueno, y nosotros vamos a continuar ayudando a estas poblaciones como lo hemos estado haciendo hasta ahora. Nadie ni nosotros solamente esperábamos tener esta pandemia o tal vez tener las protestas civiles que hemos tenido y sus implicancias económicas. Nos vamos a ajustar a lo mejor posible con los recursos que contamos. No puedo especular en estos momentos cuán profunda o cuán extensa va a ser este impacto de esta crisis en el tema específico de los sin hogar, pero si hay un aumento vamos a tratar de resolverlo lo mejor posible y vamos a tratar de proporcionar ideas y acciones cuando llegue el momento, si es que llega. Vamos a tratar obviamente de resolver este problema y reducir esos números. Ok, Armando, ¿puedes preguntarle al doctor Farley si han podido realizar pruebas de coronavirus en estos campamentos? The question is for Dr. Farley. Dr. Farley, have you been able to conduct or has the city been able to conduct testing in these camps of the homeless? Um, I'm not sure which camps you're talking about. I, if you're talking about the um, encampments uh, on the parkway, I believe the testing was offered by an organization there. No estoy seguro exactamente de qué campamentos estás hablando, Argenis, pero si se está refiriendo al que estaba en el Parkway, sé que ha habido una institución que les ha ofrecido pruebas a ellos. Sí, es justamente ese. Armando, ya, sí, ya para finalizar, eh, mi pregunta es para Sean Brown. Eh, ¿Cómo han manejado ellos la reapertura de los centros de cuidados para que no sean catalogados bajo las mismas preocupaciones que consideró el Distrito Escolar para cambiar su plan? ¿Y cuál sería el mensaje que le dan a, a los padres, a la comunidad que todavía tiene dudas de enviar a sus hijos a estos centros? The last question is from Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, uh, my question has to deal with the reopening of daycare centers. Uh, how has the kids have been different from those of the school district? And what is your message to the parents and community about sending their kids safely to daycare? I can definitely speak for PHL Pre-K. Um, I, de I think that um, we have put in a very, and, and I couldn't hear you because it cut off a little bit, Armando. Did you ask a question about the mask wearing guidance for pre-K? The question in general was about if the same criteria that the school district is implementing is the one that the daycare centers have to implement. And what would be the message for the parents and the community about sending their kids to pre uh, daycare? Sure, so I guess that's referring to the school reopening. Eh, Argenis, tu pregunta tiene que ver con el contraste entre los criterios de las escuelas y de los servicios de cuidado preescolar de los niños. Sí, no, es, es sobre la reapertura del preescolar, pero lo que yo, la duda que, que, a ver, vamos a poner el contexto. Los padres, hay muchos padres que están todavía preocupados sobre si enviar a sus hijos es seguro a estos centros de cuidado. Entonces, yo lo que quiero es explorar con ella que me dé un mensaje para esos padres y que me diga cómo ellos han manejado 
o digamos esta reapertura bajo, digamos, para que los padres no tomen eh, la misma actitud que tomaron con los con el distrito escolar en este caso. Gracias. Okay. Bernard, the question has to deal with the reopening of preschool care. And Arkenis tells us that parents are worried, have been worried about sending their kids to daycare. And what would be your message to parents and the community about how the reopening of daycare centers uh, would proceed so that you dispel some of the same attitudes that they had about sending their kids to school? Sure. I, I think that that's definitely the safety message and ensuring our, um, as Dr. Farley stated, um, we cannot necessarily say that, you know, the, the chances of someone um, contacting COVID is zero because we are still in um, around each other. Um, but it's definitely us taking the necessary safety precautions and increasing those health and safety precautions. So as I stated earlier, um, all of our eight, uh, PHL pre-K locations are responsible for putting in a very specific plan. Um, and that is deeper than just someone having um, or um, contacting COVID. Um, it's the everyday um, health and safety procedures. It is having a um, particular screening process or um, drop off process and, in, and the mask wearing guidance that's in place. I think if um, we can ensure our families that our children will be safe and that you know our staff will follow the necessary precautions to keep kids safe, that is the first one. But understanding that um, in the times that we're in, there may be a need for us to offer some um, <clears throat> alternative options or alternative care. And we're prepared to do that as well. We're working with our various stakeholders and our providers to figure out if that's necessary. And we will be sharing that message with families um, as that becomes available. But safety is first. And we are really working hard to ensure that um, the children that are in our care will be safe when, when they um, enter our programs. Thank you. Tenis, la respuesta tiene que ver nuevamente con el mensaje que ha proporcionado el comisionado Farley con respecto a la seguridad en los centros de cuidado infantil. No podemos garantizar que las posibilidades de contraer el virus sea cero, porque lo que nosotros no tenemos es esa seguridad, pero sí estamos tomando medidas y podemos hacer lo posible para poder tener precauciones y medidas de seguridad. Todos nuestros locales tienen un plan específico que va mucho más allá de solamente impedir que se contraiga el virus de la COVID-19. Hay procedimientos incluso para la entrega de los niños, para seleccionar personal, para entregarlos y recogerlos, para asegurar que las familias tengan confianza de que sus niños están en un entorno y en un contexto seguro. También comprendemos que en estos momentos de incertidumbre no tenemos una seguridad total, pero estamos también anticipando tener planes alternativos y opciones de cuidado infantil Nosotros estamos trabajando con nuestros proveedores de estos servicios y con las autoridades y todos los que tienen un interés en este tema. Y vamos a tener un mensaje disponible según sea necesario, enfatizando siempre y resaltando la seguridad de estos centros en el cuidado de nuestros niños. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Armando. Gracias a todos. Thank you to everyone. Great. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Arjenis. Um, we're going to go to Stefania Jimenez with NBC10. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my questions are for uh, Dr. Farley. Uh, so the first question that I want to ask you is about reopening schools. So we know what's happening or what's being proposed for public schools in Philadelphia. Uh, how, what are the differences between the charter schools and the Catholic schools versus, you know, public? Well, those uh, other schools, the, the parochial schools, the charter schools, the private schools, they each have their own safety plans. Uh, we are reviewing those plans and we're having conversations with them to make them be as safe as possible. But so each one, they're, they're somewhat different. But are they different because they have a different amount of students in each, you know, does it have to do with the student population? I mean, what's guiding this? No, so let's be clear. So that the, you know, we uh, set guidance that said that schools <laughs> could open in Philadelphia if they followed our guidance and our guidance is published on the website. The school district, the public schools elected not to open uh, given concerns of teachers. These other school systems have elected to open, but either one could open, uh, and uh, as long as they're consistent with our guidance. Okay. Uh, now, here, here's my final question. So, the school district is saying that some has said that some libraries and community centers would open so that parents can drop um, some kids off during school hours. Uh, what What are you telling parents so far with that? Do you, Do you have any plan laid out as far as uh, capacity, anything like that? 
So, you know, I could try to take a question, but I wonder whether Brian Abernathy wants to take that. Dr. Farley, I believe Brian Abernathy also had to hop off for another meeting, so he's no longer with us. Uh, I would just say that there are, I, we are not encouraging right now parents to just drop their children off at, the, at a library or a rec center. Uh, it, it, we, um, we're concerned about many children being dropped off um, and uh, if they're not adequate safety procedures at any location like that. Uh, the city is looking to see if there are um, places and standards that could be put in place where children could go safely. Uh, that's not in place yet. And so we're, we are definitely not encouraging parents to just have that be their plans. They're just gonna drop off at the library and go, go somewhere. Okay, just a quick follow-up. Do you happen to know at least when you'll have an update on that? Um, I'm afraid I don't because we are part of that planning, but the health department is not leading that planning. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. We're going to go to Mike um, D'Onofrio now with the Tribune. Uh, it looks like the, the mayor has and uh, Brian Abernathy have logged off. Yes, unfortunately, they had to go to another meeting. All right. I'll, uh, that's, uh, my questions were for them, so uh, I'll, I guess I'll shoot an email then. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that, Mike. All right. um, we're going to go to um, Pat Loeb at KYW. Hey, Shante still there? Hi. Yeah. Um, how does 130 locations compare to last year? Sure. So we had 100 and... 40, 138, sorry, locations last year. Um, so we have four, we, uh, four um, agencies that have opted not to be able to move forward or continue in the program. Um, they actually are not offering pre-K services for next year. So that's why, or for this year, which is why they um, opted to move out of the program. Okay, and uh, understanding that enrollment is just open, do you have a sense yet for whether there's less demand this year because of parents hesitating to send kids? We, uh, we our enrollment just really open. It's been open for a little under a month now. Um, and we anticipate that there will be some um, concern from parents entering the pre-K program or, or any program for that matter. And, and we will address those challenges as they become available. Um, we are also working with stakeholders to think about any um, remote or virtual services. But right now we are prepared and our providers are preparing to be able to offer face-to-face -face care. And we're uh, at about um, half of our enrollment number right now, 50% enrollment. So it, it's an ongoing thing. We do anticipate um, some, some differences. This is a, a different time. Um, but for right now, we're just moving forward with traditional instruction. Okay, so when you say half your enrollment, that's the 3,000 kids returning from last year? Yes. Okay, yeah, and they're committed to returning well, that, already? That, that's so we have 50% of our seats are, are already filled. So it's not necessarily that they're all filled with returners. They may be new families. I don't have that breakdown. We, we could get that to you if that's something that you need it. But right now, we just know that we're 50% we're in hold with the, the allocated seat numbers that, that our providers have. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Um, we're going to go to Martin Pratt of Philly YBN. Hey, Dr. Farley. Thank you for being available always. Um, this question is really something that's bubbling up uh, what I would consider misinformation in the African-American community. Um, recently, you know, we had this... Uh, person who uh, claims to be a doctor talk about hydroxychloroquine and because of that conversation the last three or four days online there's been a lot of conversation around a famous uh, african-american pastor in new york who was treated with that but not alone he was also treated with a uh, an antibiotic um as a chroma yes could you explain um for my readers uh why hydroxychloroquine by itself is not a good idea and why the FDA said don't use it. Well, hydroxychloroquine is a drug that's used to treat malaria. Uh, and there was some, based on laboratory um, information, there's some hope that it might've been effective against this virus. 
Um, and there've been enough studies now to, for us to know that it's not effective against the virus. Um, and any medicine that has any kind of effectiveness also has its risks. And so you never wanna take any medicine uh, that doesn't have any value. Uh, you would just be taking those risks. Specifically with hydroxychloroquine, there's concern about heart rhythm problems where your heart flutters and doesn't have its normal rhythm and that can be quite dangerous. And even if it's rare, uh, it's not a risk that you wanna take if the drug has no value. Thank you. And then also um, going back you know, again, uh, unfortunately, to some of our, our revisited conversations in the past, uh, what is the challenges of, of being in an enclosed environment, like so say for instance, a church or a small area with a group of people who are breathing, s singing, opening their mouths, you know, what's the problem with that enclosed environment um, and not wearing masks? Yeah, we're, we're particularly concerned about religious services. Uh, people tend to be very close together. Uh, and when people are singing or speaking loudly, uh, and they're putting out more respiratory droplets and they can easily travel to people that are close to you. Uh, if you're spending a long time there and some of these church services can be quite long, uh, then that increases the risk as well. Put that combination together, you can have some very major outbreaks in churches. And there have been uh, that, examples of that where many, many people were infected by a single person at a, at a single church service. Uh, so that's a, a particularly high risk situation, which we are recommending people be careful about. Our current restrictions are no indoor gatherings more than 25 people, but even with 25 people, they should really follow these other safety precautions about masks, distance, et cetera. And lastly, um, for parents who are concerned about their kids, you know, playing with other children um, who may be, who may be carriers of COVID, uh, what suggestions do you have for parents? Should all children have a mask when they play with other kids? Uh, should they be washing their hands? Uh, should they be social distancing at the playground? Uh, you know, as much as possible. I do think if your children around other children, they should be wearing masks. We know it's tough to get kids to wear masks. They're not going to necessarily follow you. But as much as possible, and you should, yes, uh, have them wash their hands as much as possible. You can get secretions on your hands, and kids are always putting their hands in their mouths. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I feel for parents who want to have their children be around other children. Uh, but right now, I would say, if it's not really necessary, then try to avoid it. So, you know, pre-K is, that's education. That's important in the long term. But other um, gatherings that are optional, I would say best to avoid. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. We're going to go now to um, David Melandria with Philly Sports Network. Dr. Farley, this is a question for you. Uh, the Phillies came out today. None of the players have had their um, tested positive, but two coaches, two members of the organization got it, and also they're canceling all activities at Citizens Bank Park until further notice. So my question to you is, do you believe that the Phillies should move their home game to another location? You know, I, I have not seen the news as of today. This is the first I'm hearing about that. Uh, I don't think so at the moment. I think that, um, you know, there's still uh, are ways that they can do this safely. They need to follow safety standards. Uh, for whatever positive test they have there, we can't guarantee that they got it at the stadium. Uh, and likewise, I don't think that the uh, one baseball team of a relatively small number of people poses a risk to the city that it's around. You know, we're a city of 1.5 million people. Uh, so the, the bigger question really is, can the, can the league continue to operate safely? Uh, I think they can if they follow their safety protocols. I'm concerned that they may, the Marlins may not have. Um, I don't know about this situation, but I think if they can do that, they can do this safely. I follow up question for you. We're less than a month away until college football season is supposed to start up. Do you believe that we'll be able to see college football start up in the fall for the, for the city of Philadelphia and for the state of Pennsylvania? You know, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Could you repeat it? We're less than a month away until the start of the college football season. And do you believe that we'll be able to see college football games be played in for Philadelphia and for the state of Pennsylvania for this season? Certainly in Philadelphia, uh, we are not recommending this anytime soon. Uh, we, right now, our guidance is that we strongly recommend and against any competitive sports like football, uh, close contact, lots of opportunity for secretions from one person to go to another person. Uh, so, um, you know, we never know what's going to happen over the course of several months. But right now, we think that's a very bad idea. And also, you're still working on the, with the Philadelphia Eagles about their season as well? Uh, that is correct. All right, thank you. Thanks, David. We're gonna go to um, Matt Petrillo now. 
Hi there. Um, thanks for your time today. Wondering about um, store points. It was mentioned before that um, th there is concern about people going down the shore. I'm wondering um, uh, wh what's your advice um, for people who want to go down the shore and, and have contact tracers in the city have they traced um, any particular outbreaks or anything to, um, uh, to our communities? So the contact tracers have not um, identified specific outbreaks uh, at short communities. However, uh, when we ask where you think you were exposed and what you've done during the time period when you might have exposed, uh, travel to the beach comes up pretty frequently. And so that makes us concerned. So our recommendations based on that is for people to avoid the, the shore. Uh, it's not so much being in the ocean that is the risk, but when you go there, people are likely to stay at a beach house. They may be going uh, you know, in, some, uh, in gatherings. Uh, they may be traveling together in a car. That whole process uh, puts people in uh, exposure with other folks. So I know this is tough, um, but uh, we would recommend against going to the shore now. So I was trying to unmute myself. Am I unmuted? Um, sorry, we're in the van, so it's a little complicated. Uh, so you're, you're not finding cases um, directly down the shore. Can, are, are you able to share um, where many of these cases are going? And, and when you look at neighboring counties, Delaware County is, is one. Uh, others are, are rising as well. Um, uh, according to their population, uh, some data past um, D Delaware's, you know, a concern when, when it's uh, compared to its population. Um, do you know what Philly is, is doing right compared to to some of its neighboring counties? Well, first, just to, as far as the data, you know, the data I presented uh, two days ago was that among people who um, uh, had this infection, 27% had traveled during the time period when they might've infected. And that's a lot. Uh, and the most common site they were talking about traveling to was the beach. So we don't know that they were infected at the beach, but the fact that it's that high makes us concerned about that. And that's uh, our recommendations based upon that. I've also noted that where we're seeing increases in New Jersey right now in cases, is Camden um, and Atlantic County, so right down there on the beach. Um, and uh, but as far as the other counties, you know, there there are many uh, differences that will determine uh, what the rate of rise is going to be in one county versus another. So I can't say that uh, the difference between the rise in Philadelphia versus Delaware County is attributable to our our more restrictive policies. I can say in general, more restrictive policies are are justified, and I'm hopeful that uh, our, we're limiting the rate of rise through that. All right, thanks for your time, appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Um, we're gonna go to Joe Brandt now of NBC10. Hi, uh, this question is for Dr. Farley. Um, we mentioned uh, the archdiocese, uh, it was briefly mentioned in a question earlier. I, could you just elaborate more on that? I mean, did, did, have, have you reviewed the plan? Is that still happening? Um, they plan to have in-person classes. Right, so we have received their plan. We're in the process of reviewing that plan um, and we will be talking to them about it. Okay, great. And um, an another thing, uh, the, the school district, public schools, they've mentioned uh, specific data points that they'll be looking at. Well, they didn't specify, but there will be data they're looking at after they go back to hybrid and then they have some in-person in, uh, in November after Thanksgiving, um, certain changes in the data would trigger going back to all online. Um, I know there's a meeting at four that's might come up, but are, can you just address like what would have to change once schools are open, what would have to change for them to go back to all online? Would it be like a rise in cases, more spread person to person? How would you define that? Yeah, so what we said before, um, uh, when there was a discussion about actually opening uh, in August or in early September, was that um, we couldn't lay out specific numbers, but we could say that the factors we're going to be looking at is uh, the rise in rates or the, the, the change in rates across the community. Uh, we look at potential outbreaks in schools if schools are open. Uh, and then we're going to look at the connections between them if we have evidence that um, cases in schools are linked to cases in a community. Uh, the worse that any of those three factors uh, is, the more likely we are to say that the school system really cannot stay open. Uh, if all of them are looking good, then we're more likely to say that they can stay open. All right. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.
Okay. Um, seeing no further questions, that does conclude our briefing for today, and we will be back next week on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Thank you.